I'll ask you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 1. Luke chapter 1. And you might be saying this morning, Pastor Mark, we finished chapter 23. Why are we going all the way back to chapter 1? Are we starting over? Well, I'll tell you this. If we went and preached through the entire Gospel of Luke again, I guarantee you we would find more truth that we missed along the way. Uh, but that's not what we're doing. We're not restarting our series here today. Uh, but as I sought the Lord for the message to preach on a Mother's Day um, with that particular occasion in connecting it as well with our theme of follow his steps, the Lord just led so clearly uh, to this passage when it was first announced to Mary that she would be the mother of Jesus. And it's amazing to me to see how before Jesus even walked this earth, Mary was demonstrating the spirit of her son, Jesus Christ. And so I look forward to sharing what God has for us here today. I'll invite you to stand in honor of God's word. And we'll be reading Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And we'll conclude our reading in verse 38. So Luke chapter 1 and verse number 26. And in the sixth month... The angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. What in the world is this all about? I guarantee if an angel showed up in your room one night and said, Hail, Natalie, that art, that art highly favored. You would probably be tripping out some too, as I mean, you might say. And so she said, what in the world is all this about? Verse number 30, the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called, bear, uh, shall be called the Son of God. And behold... Thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. There's a lot of people who would say, how can you possibly believe in a virgin birth? That is totally impossible. And we would say that. But what does God say here in his word? With God, nothing shall be impossible. How did humanity come into existence? God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. It's not that impossible when you're talking about a God who creates everything out of absolutely nothing. But I want you to notice Mary's response to all this in verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. I want to speak to you this morning about this subject. The heart of a mother who follows his steps. The heart of a mother who follows his steps. Our Father, we ask you to please bless the preaching of your word today. I pray you would open our understanding and help us to have ears to hear to be able to grasp the truth of your word, that it might minister to our hearts and help not just moms today, but all of us 
to better follow in the footsteps of our Savior Jesus. In his name I pray, amen. Thank you for standing in honor of God's word. You may be seated. I believe I'm on totally safe ground to say such a straightforward statement as this. Every mom wants to be a good mom. Every mom wants to be a good mom. You want what's best for your kids. You want to make good decisions for them. You want to do your absolute best to raise them to be good people, to be loving people, to be good husbands, good wives, good mothers and fathers. You want to raise them to be hard workers, to be friendly, kind, fun. You want your kids to be good and moral people. You want them to have some kind of a moral compass in their lives. And you know that as a mom, you have a powerfully shaping influence on each of your kids. God has given that to you. And as I mentioned earlier, that there is no greater influence that a human being has on this earth than the influence of his mother. And so that's what you want to be. If you're a mom here today, you would want to be the best mom that you possibly can be. I've had the privilege to, at times in my ministry to go and visit a, a mom who just gave birth to a newborn child in the hospital. And, you know, I'll walk in that room and knock, knock on the door and go in and, and you'll see that mom with that baby curled up in her arms. And I mean, that is precious and that's sweet and it's a joy to uh, just observe and to talk about. And, and you know what? I've never one time in my ministry or my entire life heard a mom say, you know, Pastor, my greatest desire in life is that by the time that my child is 18 years old, I will have been the worst mom of all time. <laughs> I've never heard that before. I don't think anybody wants that. That just doesn't happen. And so every mom wants to be a good mom. But perhaps the question is, well, how? How can I be a good mom? How can I be the best mom that I possibly can be? Well, I would submit to you today that there's no better way to be a good mom than to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. To live your life emulating and modeling who Jesus is to your children and to everyone around you. Of course, our theme this year is follow his steps, as we've often read Sunday at the end of our services, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. And we've seen from that verse that our, our calling as Christians is to live selflessly for the spiritual benefit of others. I want to tell our moms that are in here this morning that there is no better way that you can be a good mom than to live selflessly for the spiritual benefit of your children and others, to model who Jesus is and what he did. Do you understand that Jesus had a positive influence on every person he spent quality time with? Whether they were tax collectors, prostitutes, demon-possessed, blind, deaf, if we're talking about the hyper-religious like Nicodemus, or if we're talking about a Roman soldier and his servant, Jesus left a positive influence on every person he came into contact with. If you're here today and you've trusted Christ as your Savior, Jesus has had a majorly positive influence in your life. Not just for your eternal destiny and eternal life in heaven, but your life is probably significantly de different and you are probably a far significantly better person than the day you first met Christ. And that's because of the influence that he has had in your life. But it may even be that you're here today and you've not yet placed your faith in Jesus Christ. And maybe you have been coming to church or maybe you have been reading your Bible and maybe you are trying to figure out what you believe. And you would probably even admit today that the influence that Jesus has had on your life has been overwhelmingly positive. That there have been times that you have experienced his love, you've experienced his grace, you've experienced his long suffering in your life, though you still remain on the fence about putting your trust in him. 
And so anyone who had genuine contact with Jesus cannot deny the positive influence he has made in their lives. And so it's no wonder that we would make a statement such as this, that the best way to be a good mom is to follow his steps. But how can you become a mom who follows his steps? Because let's be honest, selflessness is not always at the top of our character. (laughs) That a lot of times we have this tendency to go for what's best for us, to do what we want, to do what we think is best, rather than considering what's best for that child or what's best for other people. And so selflessness just isn't always at the top of our list for, for who we are. And so how can you come to a place where you would live selflessly for the spiritual benefit of others? I believe we find the answer to that question in our text today. We read how uh, the angel announced to Mary that she, as a young virgin girl who was engaged to a godly man, would soon become the mother of Jesus. But before Jesus ever placed two footprints in the sand on this earth, we find that Mary was already following in his footsteps, in the footsteps her son would soon blaze. But I want to show you that there's a specific reason she came to that place. There was a a heart or a mindset in her life that allowed her to come to this place where she would follow the steps of Jesus, where she would live selflessly for the spiritual benefit of others. But I want you to understand that this isn't just a message for moms. We realize it's Mother's Day, and so there are those occasional days where we're going to take some time to really highlight a specific relationship considering uh, mothers today. But I want you to understand that God's truth for moms is God's truth for all of us today. It's true for a pastor. It's true for a husband. It's true for a wife. It's true for children. It's true for workers. It's true for students. It doesn't matter who you are. If you are a Christian, you are called to follow his steps. And the only way you will follow his steps is to have the same heart that Mary displays in our text today. Mary was handpicked by God to serve his redemptive purpose for humanity. God sends this angel named Gabriel to pronounce her as God's chosen person to bring the Savior into the world. Mary is described to us in verse number 27 as a virgin, that she was a young lady who was probably between the ages of 15 and 18 years old, and that she was pure. She had maintained a pure lifestyle. She had never been with any man before in her life. But it does tell us in verse 27 that she was espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. Well, what does espouse mean? The idea is really of a betrothal or an engagement that the way that they did marriage back in that time was that a man would give a dowry to a father and they would enter into this contractual agreement. He would ask for his daughter's hand in marriage. And at that point, they would sign official paperwork and they would become husband and wife. But it was a little different than what we do today. There would be typically a year long period of time where the woman would continue to live with her parents and the man would continue to live with his parents. They would not yet consummate the marriage relationship until the wedding day. And so there was this period of time. And that's the situation that Joseph and Mary is in, that that she is still a virgin, but they are espoused. They are already referred to as husband and wife, but they're living separately. They're not yet engaged in a physical relationship. It was a very serious and official matter. In fact, uh, to break that relationship would demand a legal divorcement as well. And and so it it was during this period, what they would do is they would prove their fidelity to each other. They would prove that for this period of time, I am reserved for my husband, I am reserved for my wife. And so that's what they would do. And then according to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 21, if when the wedding day came, if the husband discovered that his wife was not a virgin and that she had committed adultery during that that betrothal period, then it tells us that she, she and the person she committed adultery with was to be brought to the doorstep of her father's home and both of them were to be stoned to death. You might look at that and say, wow, that seems harsh. What we need to understand about the Old Testament law is that Israel was to be a holy people. 
that the laws that were given to them were to draw a distinguishing line between them and the pagan nations of the world, that they were to reflect God's heart. And what that shows us is that God is in severe or serious, I should say, support and favor of marital fidelity, that that is a sacred relationship. And that's how passionate God is about it, that adultery demanded even the death penalty. And so we're talking about this espousal period was, being a, was a very serious matter. And it tells us here that Mary was espoused to Joseph. It tells us that she was of the house in, of David, which means that she was of royal descent. That she had the line of David, the line of the Messiah. And so with all this in mind, I want you to consider for a moment the effect that an unplanned pregnancy might have on this teenage girl. Now, before you get all weirded out, she was only 50. Do you realize about 100 years ago, girls were getting married about 12, 13 years old? It's only more recently that that waited until the 20s. And so before you get weirded out about that, she was only 15, 18 years old. Understand, that was probably on the older side for marriage back in that day. But I want you to consider what this uh, would have, if the angel comes and says, you're going to conceive a child, how would this have affected her? Well, it would have brought serious question to her purity. That obviously everyone would assume that if she was pregnant and the child was not Joseph's, there's only one logical conclusion that you can come to, and that is that she was unfaithful. And that was a public disgrace to be unfaithful in that day. At best, it would have made her a public disgrace. At worst, it could have led her to being stoned to death at her father's doorstep. It also would have jeopardized her engagement with Joseph. Because if you go to Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 1, Joseph finds out that she's pregnant and he comes to the only logical conclusion, well, I haven't been with her, and if I haven't been with her and she's pregnant, then she must have been with someone else. And so he knew that the right thing to do was to follow the legal proceeding and to make her a public disgrace and to then uh, potentially even uh, bring her to the place where she would be stoned to death. But he didn't want to do that. And so Matthew 1 tells us that he was really battling with this, that, that he loved her, and so he was minded to put her away privately. But do you see the effect that that would have had on Mary? That if she comes to agreement with this angel and decides to submit herself to uh, conceiving this child and giving birth to this child, it would put her marriage in jeopardy, her relationship with Joseph. And so what this all shows us is that if Mary agrees to it, it would have put her at serious risk. There would have been some suffering that she would have gone through. It would have a terrible effect on her life, humanly speaking. It perhaps would have caused a tremendous emotional and psychological, not to mention even physical suffering in her life, especially knowing full well that she had done nothing wrong. Yet in spite of the effect, the angel considered this opportunity to be a tremendous blessing to Mary. If you look at verse number 28, it says, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. He says, Mary, you are the object of God's divine favor. He says, You are blessed among women, that you are singled out by God, the object of his favor, the object of a special blessing that other women will not receive. And you might just be saying, Well, when you consider the effect of what this pregnancy might bring, how is that a, a favored condition? Well, it's because of the child that she would prove to conceive. He says in verse 30, verse 29, she's doubting, what is this all about? Verse 30, the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. You know what the name Jesus means? The salvation of the Lord. This has messianic implications. An angel of God has not appeared to an Israelite person since the time of Daniel when Daniel was given the visions about the coming Messiah. And it was the angel by the name of Gabriel who appeared to Daniel. And now you have this same angel appearing to Mary. And, it, and all the appearances that we are given about Mary and indications are that she was raised in a godly home. She had an understanding of the word of God and no doubt would have understood the prophetic 
prophetic implications of this, that Gabriel is standing in her midst and Gabriel is telling her, you are going to conceive a child and you are going to call his name the salvation of the Lord. This is no ordinary child. Verse 32, he shall be great. He shall be called the son of the highest or the son of the most high God. And the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father, David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Now she fully grasps by the end of this statement that the child that she is about to conceive is the Holy One of Israel the Messiah, the King of the whole world, and the Savior of the whole world. She grasped the full, uh, uh, the full uh, implications of what this would mean. She understood that she was the virgin prophesied of in Isaiah chapter 7 that would conceive and give birth to a son and would call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. <laughs> God has come down. And the government would be upon his shoulders and he would be called the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace and of his kingdom. There would be no end. She understood everything that this meant, but she didn't understand how it could possibly happen. Verse number 33 or 34 says, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be seeing I know not a man? That means, how am I supposed to conceive a child if I've never had a physical relationship with a man? Because we know it takes a dad and it takes a mom to conceive a child. And she's saying, I have a husband, but I've never been with a man. How am I possibly going to conceive? And in verse 35, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. He's saying this, just as God did form man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. That's what's going to happen in your womb is not going to be a natural conception. It is going to be a supernatural conception that the Holy Spirit and the power of Almighty God is going to come upon you and in your womb he's going to fashion a body that is going to carry the life and the breath of Almighty God here on earth. That is the child that you are going to have and he'll not be an ordinary child in verse 35 he says that holy thing which shall be born of thee that holy thing every man born of man is a sinner but jesus was not born of man he was born of the holy ghost through the womb of a virgin girl he would be holy, and because he would not be born of man, he would be called the Son of God. He would not bear the sinful nature of man. He would bear the sinless nature of God in a human body. Well, like you might be saying right now, Mary was thinking, I don't know about this. I, don't, I, I know God's our creator. I've read the creation account. I know uh, he made everything out of nothing and I understand all that, but I've never seen him work like this. I've never heard of him working like this before. I don't know how this is possible. And as she's thinking through this, the angel says in verse 36, and behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, you know, your old cousin who's been barren her entire life, unable to have children you know that one she hath also conceived a son in her old age and this is the sixth month with her who was formerly called barren that was never possible yet she is six months pregnant how for with god nothing shall be impossible mary has been presented with the high honor of being used to accomplish God's redemptive purpose. Her child would facilitate salvation to the ends of the earth, but submitting to God's plan may cause her some suffering. It may cause her some embarrassment. It may cause her some harassment and some uncertainty and perhaps even physical suffering. And so the question for us right now is this, how is Mary going to respond to this? When you, considering, when you consider what this pregnancy might bring into her life, what's she going to do? Well, verse 38 tells us, 
And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. You know what that means? Mary submitted her entire life to the redemptive purpose of God. Her entire life. She uh, put her life in God's hands and she considers herself to be a handmaid to the Lord. Well, what does that mean? A handmaid is a name for a female bond servant. What would happen in their day and time was that a, a man might become so poverty stricken that, or so indebted that he could no longer take care of his family. He could no longer take care of his daughter. And so they would be living on the streets in the muck and mire. And in that day, it was very hard for you to climb yourself out of that kind of situation. And so instead of subjecting his daughter to this poverty stricken life, he would often come to a contractual agreement with with a wealthy individual and he would sell his daughter to that man to either become his wife or to be reserved to be the wife of his son. But I want you to know this wasn't ordinary slavery the way that it's talked about today or the way that we think about it because when we were going through the book of Exodus, what did we find there in Exodus chapter 21? That this master was not to treat this girl like she was a slave. He was to treat this girl like she was a daughter. She was to be given the full benefits of being a daughter. She was to be brought into the inheritance. She was to be fed. She was to be loved on. She was to be cared for. Her, her husband or, or the son who was being uh, reserved for her, that, that he was to remain faithful to her. And he was not to just cast her out. And he couldn't just kick her out of her house. No, this was a way of protecting this girl. And in exchange for the loving, the caring, and the fatherly protection and provision for her, this girl would do whatever this master said, would serve him in whatever capacity he needed, would do whatever he said, would go wherever he sent, would serve however he required in exchange for his love, his care, and his provision for her. That's what Mary is talking about right now. Because God has showered his favor on me because he has chosen to bless me in this way, in spite of the suffering it may bring, in spite of the embarrassment, in spite of the harassment, in spite of the jeopardy it might put my relationship with Joseph in, in spite of all the personal suffering it may bring to my life, I am your servant. I will do what you say. I will go where you say to go. I will, I will serve however you want me to serve. I am at your exclusive disposal. I am the Lord's handmaid. And what we realize is this, that the idea of this passage is that Mary followed the steps of Jesus by submitting her entire life to the redemptive purposes of God, regardless of how it might affect her. And it would affect her. That yeah, she would experience those personal uh, effects and the personal suffering, but it would also bring, bring an effect upon her on a motherly level. Consider the life that Jesus lived, the submitting her entire life to God's redemptive purpose. It meant doing everything that she possibly could to raise Jesus under the authority of God's word. It meant doing everything that she could to protect the life of this child, even if it meant fleeing to Egypt when, when they were trying to destroy Jesus in his youth. She had to leave her family and her friends and all things that were familiar, and she and Joseph had to go all the way down to Egypt to a distant country to protect the life of this precious child. But then as that child grew, it would mean sitting by and watching as he faced the scrutiny as he faced the charges of blasphemy, the shouts of the mob, and ultimately it meant helplessly watching as her son gave his life for the sins of humanity on the cross. But in spite of how it affected her, she remained submitted to the Lord and was willing to do whatever was necessary for God's redemption 
to flow through her life to all the world. It's an amazing thing. Mary was totally and completely submitted to God's redemptive purpose. Now, here's the question I want to ask you today. What about you? What about you? How can you, as a Christian, how can you, as a mom, how can you live selflessly for the spiritual benefit of others? How can you come to a place in your life where you're so willing to set yourself aside in order to do what's best for your kids, in order to do what's best for their spiritual life, in order to do what's best for others around you? How do you come to the place where you're willing to follow his steps? And the answer is that you have to have the same heart that Mary had, that a godly mother follows Jesus' steps by submitting her entire life to his his redemptive purpose, regardless of how it may affect her life. And the reality is that submitting your life to God's purpose can mean any number of the things that it meant for Mary. There may be times when your decision to follow Christ causes embarrassment to your family. Times when you may face ridicule from your friends times when it may create tension between you and your husband or your boyfriend or your fiance. It means doing everything that you can to both live your life and to raise your children under the authority of God's word. To be sure that you're getting those kids to church no matter what's going on in your life. No matter how tired you may be or no matter what else you may want to do, it's realizing God has a plan and purpose for this child in his redemptive purpose and I need to submit my life to his redemptive purpose so that my my child can learn about Jesus and can come to place their faith in Jesus and then go on to be used for the glory of Jesus. It means doing everything that you can to protect your children from a world that seeks to destroy them in their youth. That may mean paying the price for them to go to a Christian school, or it may mean quitting your job so that you can homeschool, or it may mean pouring hours into researching schools to find one that doesn't indoctrinate kids and try to destroy their identity and try to destroy their faith and try to destroy their belief in God, but you're trying to find a place where they can be educated. And that takes time, and it takes research, and it may take hours, days, or even years, and much time in prayer, but regardless of what it may cost you, as a mother, if you're submitted to God's redemptive purpose, you're going to do whatever's necessary to see that purpose fulfilled in your child's life. Now, let me say this, that it means reading your Bible, praying with your children, being a positive influence in their life for Christ. It may mean monitoring who their friends are or perhaps limiting their screen time. Because we realize every single thing that they watch on a screen influences them. And if they're hearing more from that screen than they're hearing from the Word of God from their mom, where do you think that influence is going to take them? Now let me say this, that I'm not talking about helicopter parents. I'm not talking about always hovering over your kids, making sure they're never going to experience cuts and bruises and never going to get hurt by anyone. And I'm not talking about that. You know, oftentimes I'll joke with Hannah about being a helicopter mom. And uh, this last week as we were on vacation, we were kind of sitting poolside and they had this uh, little splash pad for the kids with water slides and stuff. And Jesse was uh, over there playing and going down the slides and everything. Hannah and I were off to the side talking and I saw Jesse kind of go around the corner. And a few minutes later, Hannah was like, I haven't seen Jesse in a little bit. And I said, well, just a few minutes ago, she was kind of going around the corner. She's over there. Are you, are you, are you sure? <laughs> was her response. Are, are, are you sure she's over there? I don't know. I mean, uh, and so then she's like, let me go check on her. And I was like, okay, don't be a helicopter. I so I told her, but she said, I'm going to go check on her. So she goes over there and she can't see her anywhere. And she goes up the stairs and goes to this uh, big tube slide. And she looks inside there and she starts hearing Jesse's voice. And she thinks maybe Jesse's in trouble. And so Hannah dives into that slide. And what she comes to realize very quickly is that Jesse had climbed her way all the way up that water slide to that very last corner. And as Hannah's coming down that corner, boof takes her out and takes her all the way down the slide. And by the time she comes out of the slide, she's holding Jesse and Jesse's kind of crying and, and whimpering a little bit. And, and Hannah comes over, tells me what happened. And, and I, I just had to say, see, if you would have let that child climb up that slide, she would have accomplished a major feat 
for those, <laughs> that little body. But sometimes being a helicopter mom will hurt them more than it helps them. <laughs> you know, we were teasing, we were joking about it, but isn't that really true? That sometimes your attempt to overprotect your kids can actually serve to hurt them. And so I'm not talking about being overprotective, but what I am saying is there must come a time in your life when as a parent, when you're dealing with a child or you're dealing even with a teenager or perhaps even an adult child, when you've got to put your foot down and you've got to say, no, I can't let this go on anymore because son, God has a plan for your life. I can't let you date that girl anymore because God's got a plan for your life and she's going a totally different direction. And she may even be a Christian girl. She may even be a girl in church, but your lives are just going different ways when a parent Parents got to put their foot down and just say, no, God has a plan for your life and you need to follow his plan because his plan will lead you to do great things for God, whereas her plan will lead you to do nothing for God, nothing that matters for eternity. I'm just saying as a parent, there are times you got to step in and you do have to protect your child, no matter how you may be branded as an overprotective parent or how you may be branded as a sheltering parent and the ridicule you might face for the way that you raise, you don't let your kid have a cell phone at age 12, what's wrong with you? No, my kid's not having a cell phone until they can pay for it. <laughs> so, but, but you may face ridicule like that. But you got to be willing to take those things on in order to protect that child's life and to preserve God's purpose in that child's life. There's a world out there that seeks to destroy our youth. And we need some godly moms who are going to take on that responsibility. And let me just say this. We need some godly dads who are not going to just let mom take care of everything spiritually with the kids, but some men who are going to man up and they're going to be the spiritual leader in their home and love on their kids and read the Bible and pray and teach the Bible to their kids. And where a dad's not going to make mom always be the bad guy putting her foot down, but dad's going to step up and say, no, I'm going to take that responsibility. And honey, you're not going to date that boy because he's a bozo. He might as well have a, a, a nose, a big red ball on his nose. <laughs> there are times that you've got to do that. Sometimes being submitted to God's redemptive purpose means as that child grows, that all you can do is stand by and watch as your child faces the scrutiny for the stands they choose to take for Christ. Sometimes it may mean allowing your daughter to marry a young man who is called to some third world country as a missionary like Cambodia or India or, or Nepal or perhaps some hostile Muslim country that hates Christianity and, and murders Christians on a daily basis. There may come a time in your life where for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of those kids being raised in those Muslim homes and those kids being raised in desperate poverty of Hinduism and Buddhism where they can hear about what Jesus Jesus has done for them and that there's a God who loves them and a God who came down for them and died for them so that they could be saved. And it may mean that it brings some personal suffering to your life where maybe you don't get to see your kid, but every four or five years when they come back on furlough and maybe you don't get to see your grandkids grow up and no, no doubt that that's a dream. But when we're talking about following his steps, it means that we are living selflessly for the spiritual benefit of others, that we're willing to embrace some suffering that others might be saved. And the only way that you come to that place is when you submit your entire life to God's redemptive purpose, just like Mary did here, when you're willing to just simply say, behold the handmaid of the Lord. I am your servant. Do whatever you will with my life. But can I just say to you, this is not just true of mothers that this is true of fathers and this is true of husbands and this is true of wives and it's true of a college student and it's true of a high school freshman and it's true of a retired parent and it's true for a 23 year old entry level worker. If we are to follow Jesus steps, it begins with having a heart like Mary that is willing to submit our entire lives for the, to, to the redemptive purposes that God is trying to accomplish all around the world through his church. And, and so you, you, if we're, if we're going to follow, him, we've got to come to that place where we just say, Lord, you're my master and I'm your servant. I'll do whatever you want. I'll say whatever you want me to say. I'll go wherever you want me to go and I'll serve however you want me to serve to accomplish your redemptive purpose. My life is in your hands.
no matter what it may cost me. You might be wondering at this point, why should I do that? Why should I submit my entire life to God's purpose? What about my purpose? What about my ambitions? What about the experiences I want to experience? What about the money that I want to get? What about the home that I want to own? What about everything that I want to do? Why should I submit my life to God's redemptive purpose? The answer is very simple. Because God submitted his entire life to your redemption. That God, who never sinned one time, left the glory of heaven And he came and was embodied in human flesh. And he walked among those who offended him, those who sinned against him. And he subjected himself to our suffering, to, to what a scrape feels like, to what a gash feels like, to what a trip and a stumble and a fall feels like, to what hunger feels like, to what thirst feels like, to what grief feels like, to what pain and suffering and even death feels like. That is what God did for you. And he didn't just go part of the way. He went all the way to the cross and he hung there as we've seen recently and he laid down his life on the cross so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be saved, so that you could have eternal life and you could come to a place where you would sing, when I meet his gaze, I will see his face and I will sing his praise forever Jesus all sorrow is past I'm home at last with my king forever Jesus there's nothing that you can possibly do to receive that other than place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that's exactly the way that God made it he didn't say you got to climb a mountain to come to me he didn't say you got to give enough money to come to me he didn't say you got to be baptized to come to me no he said just trust in what Jesus has done for you and I will save you He paid the ultimate price. He experienced the ultimate suffering for our redemption. And it only makes sense that we would be willing to embrace suffering, to embrace cost, to embrace whatever is necessary for his glory's sake and that others might be saved. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. If you're a Christian in here this morning, it's your call. It's your call to submit your entire life to God's redemptive purpose no matter what the cost may be to you. That may mean sacrificially giving to missions so that other people on the other world, on the other side of the world might hear about Jesus and be saved. It might mean giving two hours of your time every Saturday to go to all church outreach and invite people to church and share the gospel with people. It may mean surrendering your very life to go to a foreign field and to give your life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It may mean spending hours in language studies and trying to learn these unique dialects of the, I don't remember how many there were in in India, but there were thousands of dialects and you're trying to learn several of them. And that takes a lot of study and a lot of hard work. And so it may mean giving your life for the sake of the gospel. That's certainly what it meant for my mother-in-law, whose name is also Mary. She grew up in somewhat of a privileged, wealthy Catholic home in Northern Alabama lived in a mansion off the Tennessee River, a father who owned several newspapers and was a millionaire. That's the life she came from. She accepted Christ as her Savior in her teenage years at a Baptist church and started going to church. And in college, she met my father-in-law, whose name is Mike, And Mike was not saved as well. He was a devout Catholic, was an altar boy, and didn't grow up in quite the privileged situation that she was in. He was in the military, but but he wanted to date her. And she said, you have to go to church if you're going to date me. So he went to church. And he had no idea what he was getting into. At church, 
he met Jesus. And Jesus changed his life. And God began to do an amazing work. And he began to be involved in ministries. And when he got out of the military, he went back and was involved in a church planting ministry. God began to work on his heart more. And he began to take missions trips with his family, my wife included. And they would go down to Mexico. And after several missions trips, God called my father-in-law to go and be a missionary in Mexico City. One of the most dangerous cities in the entire world. My mother-in-law, Mary, from her privileged life, really struggled and resisted the idea of going to Mexico City. So much so that at times in her heart, she just refused, mostly out of fear of dying because of the dangerous situation there. But what ended up happening was Mary was diagnosed not once, but twice with cancer. And by her own testimony, she would say that God showed her through that, Mary, you can die right here in the United States just as much as you could die in Mexico City and just as quickly as you could die in Mexico City. The only difference will be, what did you do with your life? Did you stay here out of fear and do nothing for the redemptive purposes of God? Or will you go to Mexico and risk it all, serving the redemptive purposes of God? And God broke her in those moments, and she surrendered her life and made a decision like Mary in this text, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. And shortly thereafter, to the astonishment of the doctors, her cancer was gone miraculously healed. They had no explanation for it, but she knew it was God. And so they began to prepare to go to Mexico, and she faced pressure on a different front, the front of her family. Her wealthy father did everything that he could to get her to stay. He offered to build her a house on the Tennessee River if she would leave Mike and bring the grandkids back to Alabama. He threatened to cut her out of the inheritance, which would have been very large. And in fact, he did that. But she came to the place where she had to say, none of that matters. Because I have a God who came and died to redeem me. And now he's calling me to follow in his steps and to be willing to go to this dangerous place and to be willing to give my life for the gospel. And she came to this response, behold the handmaid of the Lord. And 12 years ago, they went to Mexico City and God has used them to win hundreds of Mexican souls to Jesus Christ. And they have planted a thriving church in that city and God is using them in tremendous ways but the cherry on top is this that four years ago as her father laid on his deathbed she led him to Christ and three days later he passed away and I just wonder if she never made the decision to follow in the footsteps of Jesus would her father ever have come to the place where he saw Jesus Christ worthy of his total faith? He's in heaven today. And they've conducted several funerals in Mexico of people that are seeing his face and seeing his praise forever because she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. And so following his steps means living selflessly for the spiritual benefit of others. And the only way to come to that place, whether you're a mom or if you're a Christian of any other type here today, is to come to the place where you say, behold the handmaid or the bondservant of the Lord. You are my master. I am your servant. Use my life however you see fit for your redemptive purpose. And when you submit your life in that way, 
you'll find it far easier to set the cost aside in order to see others come to faith in Christ. Because Jesus did so for us. May we follow his steps and do the same for his glory and for the redemption of humanity. Our Father, we come before you this morning humbled and grateful for what Jesus did for us. That he gave his life and he experienced all the suffering and all the pain and the death for our redemption. And I pray that you would help us to do the same for the sake of the gospel. I pray that if there's anyone here who has not yet trusted Jesus as their Savior, that they would make the decision today that I'm setting doubt aside, I'm setting fear aside, I'm setting whatever suffering, ridicule, or relationship aside that I may experience because of this decision. And I'm putting all my faith in Jesus for my salvation. Oh God, give them the grace and understanding to make that decision today. I pray for moms here today that are doing their very best to be the best mom they can be. And I pray that they would see plain and clear that the only way to do that is to have a heart like Mary, to submit their entire life to your redemptive purpose. But the beauty is how they get to see you use their life in that purpose. And so we rejoice in our Savior, and I ask you to help us to respond appropriately. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.